Hey guys, this is Trey with Triple L Rustic Designs, and in this video, I'm going to be taking these camphor slabs and turning them into the most epic man cave coffee table you've ever seen. Stick around and find out how I do it. So if you guys remember a few videos back, I found this camphor log on the side of the road, and I put it on the sawmill and made some beautiful slabs out of it. After that, we put the slabs in our lumber kiln and dried them down to 10%. And today I'm going to be taking one of those slabs and turning it into an epoxy coffee table. So one thing I did for creating these coffee table projects was take some scrap lumber and make a frame the size of the mold. And it really helps you get a view of what your project is going to look like when you cut it down to size. Once I figure out how I want the project to look inside the epoxy mold, I use a pencil to trace out the inside of the frame so I know where to make my cuts. To make the cuts, we're going to take the slabs outside and get them set up on some sawhorses where we will use our Festool TS-75 track saw. Now if you're familiar with the Festool track saw, you're going to immediately notice the mistake I'm making here on this first cut, and I don't recognize the mistake until I'm halfway through with my second pass. But as you can see, I clamped the track to the wrong side of the cut, so as I make this cut, if I was to go all the way through without holding it, the entire cutoff piece and the track would have fell to the ground. Luckily, I noticed it and saved it from falling. As with all projects, we're going to use that as a learning lesson. So on this cut, I'll get the track clamped down to the correct side of the line, and we will make our cuts the correct way this time. For making these longer cuts, we're going to switch over to our 75-inch track, and after we make that cut, then we're going to repeat the exact same process on the other slab. After that, we're going to take the slab over to our vise and we're going to clamp the slab down in the vise between two pieces of wood. Here we will begin removing the bark from the live edge part of the slab using a draw knife. As you can see, the draw knife works very well, but if you don't have a draw knife, you could always sand away the bark. You could use a chisel or sometimes we even use a drywall putty knife. And the reason we want to do this is because we need to get rid of all of the bark so that the epoxy can bond directly to the wood. If the epoxy was to bond to the bark instead of the wood, then later on down the road, the bark could become detached from the wood, causing your project to crack or even split in half. Now, by far, the easiest way to remove the bark is to get underneath it, and then the entire thing should just pop off just like this. After we finished removing all the bark and any loose debris from the slabs, we can then take them inside and put them into the epoxy mold. You may notice that I'm putting these slabs into the mold in a way that most people would consider upside down. And the reason I say that is because what you're looking at right now is the bottom of these slabs. The bottom of these slabs actually had way cooler grain than the top, so that's why I'm orienting them like this. It is going to take away from seeing the live edge because now the live edge kind of tucks underneath the slabs. But what I have planned for this table, seeing the live edge is not really going to matter too much. Now that I've made sure the slabs fit in the mold, I'm going to take them out and it's time to prep the mold for the epoxy pour. To do this, I'm using a plastic scraper and I'm just scraping away any drops or leftover epoxy from a previous project. Next, we're going to apply some mold release to the epoxy mold. You don't necessarily have to do this because the epoxy will not bond to the HDPE mold, but it does make it a lot easier when you go to demold your project. It almost just pops right out of the mold. This is by far the best mold release that we've found, and we get it from the same place that we get our epoxy, and that is from the company SuperClear. I will have a link in the description below this video if you're interested. After giving the mold release a few minutes to dry, we buffed it off with a cotton towel and now we can put our slabs back into the mold and get ready for the epoxy. We need to make sure we weigh down our slabs so they don't float in the epoxy. So to do this, we're going to use some little cutoff pieces of HDPE and then some hand weights. We like to put our hand weights on top of the pieces of HDPE because if the epoxy does flow over top of the slabs, it will not bond to the pieces of HDPE so we'll just be able to pop them out in the end. It's finally time to start pouring the epoxy into this project, and to do that, we are using this super clear liquid glass deep pour 24. This deep pour 24 is capable of pouring up to one inch thick. It cures in about 24 hours, and it's a two to one mix ratio. Now you're probably looking at this project and thinking that's thicker than one inch, I don't understand. Well, what I'm doing is just making up enough epoxy that I can add some color and pour in a color lock-in layer about quarter inch thick on the bottom of this coffee table. 
For the color, we're going to use Japanese Steel Gray from the company Eye Candy Pigments. If you like the way this turns out, you can buy these pigments directly from Super Clear's website. I will have a link to that in the description below this video. I like using the Super Clear Deep Pore 24 for these lock-in color layers because the epoxy starts to set up in a few hours, so that means less time of me sitting around babysitting waiting to trap in the swirls. And if you don't know what I mean by trapping the swirls, that's when you come back after a few hours when the epoxy starts to get thicker and you swirl in some designs just like this. After letting that first layer cure overnight, it's been about 24 hours and time to insert our bullet shell casings. When casting shell casings in these epoxy projects like this, I like to use Starbond CA glue to glue down each shell casing to that first layer of epoxy so that when I pour that next layer, it doesn't push any of the shell casings out of the way or they don't try to float. This can be pretty time consuming, but using that Starbond CA glue with the activator locks these bullets into place instantly. If you're interested, I have a link to the Starbond CA glue in the description below this video. Now that we have all of our bullet casings locked in place, we need to mix up our first layer of clear epoxy. And for this, we're gonna be using the Super Clear Deep Pour 24 again. And the reason that I chose the Deep Pour 24 again instead of the Liquid Glass Deep Pour is because this first clear layer of epoxy, I'm pouring it only about a quarter inch deep and right to the top of the bullet casings. The reason I'm doing it this way is because all of these bullet casings I did not pre-fill with epoxy beforehand. So by doing it like this and pouring the epoxy right to the top of them, it allows the bubbles to exit the bullet casings and pop themselves right at the surface. After I've poured, I will come back about every 10 minutes and lightly use a heat torch to pop any bubbles as they rise to the top. Here is a perfect example of why I poured that first layer right to the top of the bullets so that the bubbles can come out of the hollow bullets, hit the surface, and pop themselves. Now we just need to wait another 24 hours for this first clear layer to cure and then we'll come back, sand it, and pour our next layer of epoxy. After 24 hours has passed, it's time to come back to our crystal clear, beautiful looking project and destroy it with some sandpaper. Here I'm taking some 120 grit sandpaper and I'm just gonna work my way down sanding all of the clear epoxy. And if you're cringing watching this part, don't worry, we are gonna make this beautiful again, just like you saw in the beginning of this video but this step is necessary so that we can pour the next layer of epoxy and it bonds well to this first layer. Little pro tip, if you did not pour your first layer of clear epoxy above the shell casings, if you hit those shell casings with the sandpaper, when you pour the next layer of clear epoxy, you will be able to see any marks on the bullet casings from the sandpaper. After that, we're gonna use some compressed air to blow away all that epoxy dust and some denatured alcohol to wipe everything down. Now we're gonna use this super clear liquid glass thick pour to pour our second layer of clear epoxy. This thick pour epoxy is good for pouring two to four inches thick and it cures in about three days. Like all super clear products in this video, I will have a link to this in the description below if you're interested in purchasing some. When doing any epoxy projects, it is very important to make sure you mix your epoxy thoroughly. So we spend five to seven minutes mixing our epoxy and then we move on to the next step, which is removing the bubbles by using a pressure pot. When using the pressure pot, we like to make sure it's on a flat surface and then we put our epoxy inside and slowly bring the pressure up to about 50 or 60 PSI. We let the epoxy sit in the pressure pot for about 10 minutes and then slowly release the pressure and remove the epoxy from the pot. As you can see, the pressure pot has removed all bubbles from the epoxy and it is now ready to be poured into our project. We can go ahead and put our second cup of epoxy into the pressure pot, get it pressurized so it can start eliminating all those micro bubbles. And while that's under pressure, we will go ahead and start pouring that first batch of epoxy into the project. When pouring this clear epoxy fresh out of the pressure pot, I like to pour it in one spot at one end of the mold and let it run down through the project all the way to the other side. This way, it'll help eliminate as many bubbles as possible that are introduced while pouring. After that, just like before, we're going to use a heat torch and lightly pass over the epoxy, popping any bubbles as they rise to the surface. As you can see, using the pressure pot to remove any micro bubbles is a really important step when making projects like this. Looking down in there right now, we have no bubbles. So we'll go ahead and pour our next layer of epoxy and fill it up to the top. Now I'm sure some of you are wondering why I didn't just use a bigger bucket to pour all this clear epoxy. 
The reason I use these two 60 ounce buckets is because they're easier to put into the pressure pot and then I also feel like I can measure the epoxy more accurately in these little mixing buckets than I can in a big mixing bucket. If you guys are interested in this epoxy mold that I'm using, this is actually a 24 inch by 48 inch reusable HDPE epoxy mold and we sell them on our website. Currently, I have about 10 left in stock, so if you're interested in purchasing one, you can head over to our website. I'll have a link in the description below. We sell these molds for $275 with free shipping. So if you're interested in getting a good epoxy mold that you can pour multiple coffee table projects in, go ahead, head over to our website right now and purchase one while we have them. While I was letting that clear epoxy set up for the next three days, I got to thinking, why don't I make a set of matching coasters to go along with this super awesome coffee table. To do that, I'm gonna use the silicone coaster mold from the company Crafted Elements, and I'm gonna repeat the exact same process that I did for the coffee table, which is pour a color layer first, add in the bullets, and then pour a clear layer of epoxy on top. Three days have passed and our coffee table is now cured. As the epoxy was curing though, it did shrink down below the surface of the wood, which is normal for it to do, so we're just gonna scuff it up with some sandpaper, and pour a little bit more epoxy to raise that level right to the top of the wood. We're using the Super Clear Deep Pour 24 to do this, so while that is curing overnight, we can go ahead and work on our coasters and take them out of the silicone mold. As you can see, I'm just using some compressed air to blow under the coasters and it just pops them right out of the silicone mold. You could also just bend the mold and peel it right off the coasters. That's what's so great about these silicone molds from Crafted Elements. They are by far the easiest molds to use when it comes to these epoxy projects. If you're interested in checking out some Crafted Element silicone molds, I will have a link in the description below this video. Typically when projects come out of these silicone molds, they do have a sharp edge on them. So we're gonna take these coasters over to the router table and we will put a nice chamfer on the edge. To do that, we're gonna use this chamfer bit and a push block, and to give the push block a little extra grip, we're gonna use some masking tape. As you can see, we just run the coaster along the router bit, which will get rid of those sharp edges and leave us with a nice clean chamfer on the edge. After completing this step 15 more times and putting a nice clean chamfer on all of the coasters, we can now take them back over to our work table and just like with the coffee table, we're gonna take away that beautiful clarity and destroy it with some sandpaper. Some of you are probably wondering why I'm doing this, and the reason is because when you run those coasters across the router table, it does put some scratches on the face of those coasters. And not only that, but when I put that chamfer on the edges of the coasters, it took away the crystal clarity, so we need to get them all sanded down and cleaned up so we can apply a flood coat of epoxy. Typically you would see people set these up and apply what's called a flood coat, which is where you just pour some epoxy on the coasters and let it run over the edges. I decided to try a different method with these. I took a small arts and crafts paintbrush and I decided to paint on a clear layer of epoxy. Surprisingly, this method worked very well. I was concerned that I would see some of those brush strokes from that paintbrush, but the super clear deep pour 24 self leveled and turned out pretty much flawless. While those coasters are curing overnight, we can get back to work on our coffee table and it is finally time to remove the coffee table from the epoxy mold. To do that, we're gonna use a rubber mallet and work our way around the mold, lightly tapping the sides to separate the epoxy from the mold. After that, I use some compressed air to blow down the sides of the mold and then we're gonna flip it over and I'm gonna show you in real time how simple it is to remove projects from these big HDPE epoxy molds that we sell on our website. We sell these molds in all different sizes, but we've noticed that these larger projects in these coffee table size molds release from the mold a lot easier, and that's because they have more weight to them. So after tapping the bottom of the mold with a rubber mallet, you will hear it release, and then you can get your mold out of the way and continue working on your project. Now, as you can see, this project is turning out pretty awesome. The clarity on that super clear epoxy is just absolutely insane. There's not a single bubble in there, but just like my 17 year old heart in high school, this project is going to suffer some emotional damage. So let's take it outside and I'm going to show you what's next. With all epoxy projects, big or small, after it's done curing, it's going to need to go through a flattening process again. And for the charcuterie boards, we can just run them through the planer and the sander. But for these bigger projects like a coffee table or even a dining room size table, it is a lot more difficult to flatten them. 
Since we make so many slabs on our sawmill, we decided to invest in a good slab flattening machine. So this is the Slab Miser from Wood Miser, and this thing is an absolute beast. It has a 13 foot by 72 inch bed, and it has a three horsepower motor with five four-sided carbide blades. This machine is not only great for flattening slabs, but it can also be used to flatten these epoxy table projects. So we offer flattening services to the public for $85 an hour, and customers are always bringing us their epoxy projects to get flattened. Typically, a coffee table this size would take probably three to four hours to flatten with a router in a homemade slab flattening mill but on our slab miser we were able to flatten both sides of this table in about 30 minutes if you're interested in learning more about this slab miser machine we have done a few videos on our youtube channel that go into more detail about the machine and how to use it but now that our slab is flat we can take it back inside and continue working on this project the next thing we need to do is take our project over to the table saw and clean up the edges. The HDPE epoxy molds are designed with a 7 degree angle on the sides and they make it that way to help the project come out of the mold easier. The good part is that even with a 7 degree angle, the sides are still perfectly straight so you can just run them along your table saw fence to cut off all that excess epoxy. Now that this project is a complete emotional wreck, just like my eight month pregnant wife, it is time for the most important part of this process, and that is providing love and support through sanding. Now I know you can't tell, but this is the top of the project, the one that was super clear in the beginning. When it comes to making clear epoxy projects like this, there's two methods to bring back that clarity. The first and easiest method would be to sand the project and then pour a flood coat of epoxy over the whole thing. But being that I want to challenge myself, I'm going to take option number two, which is to sand the wood on this project up to 150 grit and then sand the epoxy on this project up to 10,000 grit and then polish it after that. Before we get into that process though, we're going to stop at 320 grit and flip the project over to install our table legs. If we were to complete the polishing process, then install our legs, we could possibly cause some scratches to the surface. For the legs on this coffee table, I decided to go with an X-style metal leg that is powder coated black. If you like the way these legs look, I actually bought these from Amazon for about $67. I will have a link to them in the description below this video. So my main goal of this video is to show you the sanding and polishing process of clear epoxy. So I'm going to kind of go quickly through installing these legs on the bottom of the table. If you do want to see a more detailed process of installing table legs on the bottom of these tables, I would encourage you to watch one of our recent videos where I made a $5,000 black walnut dining room table. In that video, I get some close-up shots and thoroughly explain how to install the table legs. In the beginning of this project, when I was laying out the slabs in the epoxy mold, I did not think about how I was going to install the legs on the bottom of the slabs. As you can see on this end of the project, I have two spots where there's epoxy, so I'm just going to install four threaded inserts in the wood between that two spots of epoxy, so that way I can bolt down the table legs to those threaded inserts. Now this is one thing I do want to show you. When you buy these table legs from Amazon, they often come with these holes that are just too small for using with bolts and threaded inserts. There is an easy fix for this though, and that is to clamp the table legs down to a steady surface and just use a metal drill bit to drill out the holes wider so that you can fit your bolts down through. One thing that is nice about the Amazon legs though is they usually come with pre-installed threads and adjustable leveler feet. Now that we have one side installed, we'll quickly get that other leg installed and then we'll go ahead and flip this slab over so I can get back to showing you how to sand it crystal clear. So for the top of this table, we've already sanded the wood to 150 grit in the clear epoxy to 320 grit. It is now time to start our wet sanding process. Using a squirt bottle, I spray some water onto the epoxy. You want to make sure you have a decent amount of water for this process, but not too much water that you're just flooding the slab. Using 400 grit and a slower speed on your sander, you're going to begin sanding the epoxy. When doing this, you're not really putting too much pressure. You just want to lightly press your sander to the surface and work your way around the epoxy, making sure you hit all parts of the epoxy. Now you can use pretty much whatever sander you have in your shop to complete this process, but if you want to upgrade to a really, really nice sanding system, I would highly encourage you to check out this Surf Prep sander. 
This 5-inch electric ray sander from Surf Prep is by far the best sander that we have in our shop. It has variable speeds and can be hooked up to dust collection, and this thing is just the bee's knees when it comes to sanding. If you're interested in checking out all the incredible products that Surf Prep has to offer, I will have a link in the description below this video. Now, as much as I want to show you each individual grit, for the sake of keeping this video somewhat short, we're gonna fast forward through this process. Now that you know what to do, we're gonna wet sand from 400 all the way up to 10,000 grit, and we're gonna make sure to wipe down the project in between each grit. As you can see with each grit, the project is gonna get more and more clear as you work your way up to 10,000 grit. Once you reach 10,000 grit, we're gonna wipe down the project with some denatured alcohol. So if you were to stop here after sanding to 10,000 grit, this is what the project would look like. It's clear, but it's not crystal clear like we want. It would get a little bit more clear when you add oil to the project, but we can take this epoxy to the next level and that is through polishing. We're gonna be using the 3M Perfected Buffing and Polishing Compounds. If you're interested in these polishing compounds, I will have a link to them in the description below this video. I first start out with rubbing compound number one. The number on the bottle should be 06085. Using this compound, I put a few drops on the epoxy. You don't need a lot of compound to do this process. After that, I use my finger and I just spread the compound around, making sure to have it on all parts of the epoxy. Now, if I was you, I would skip this next step, which is knocking the bottle of compound off the table, letting it fall to the floor, and cracking the bottom of the bottle, shooting out compound all over everything around it. After we get everything cleaned up, we go right back to spreading that compound around the project, only on the epoxy. Now we're gonna take our DeWalt polisher and we are going to polish the epoxy just like you would on a car. I like to start on one side of the project and work my way all the way down to the other side, making sure I'm hitting all parts of the epoxy thoroughly and polishing until I remove all of the compound. Now, as you can see, after that first polishing process, the project is looking so much clearer and if you wanna stop there, you're more than welcome to. But like I said, we are gonna take this epoxy to the next level. So we're gonna move on to polishing compound number two. The number on the bottle should be 06064. And we're just gonna apply it in the exact same method and polish it in just the same. We are still using that same blue polishing pad on the DeWalt buffer. It is considered a T40 polish and it is the second to highest polishing pad that we have in our kit. If you guys are interested in these polishing pads, I will have a link to them in the description below this video. Now, everything I'm doing here, I have learned from either watching other people on YouTube or just learned by my mistakes. So if you guys are watching this and you guys know anything about polishing a car or polishing epoxy, I could really use your help. If you have any helpful feedback, feel free to drop it in the comment section down below. I'm sure I've got some guys out there that are good at detailing cars or some guys that are even better at polishing epoxy. And like I said, I need your help. So if you want to drop a comment down below on something that you see that I did wrong or something that I did good, any feedback would help. Now you see that I'm applying more compound and this is actually the same compound number two. I don't know if this is necessarily needed, but I found that if I buff in the same compound twice, wiping down the project in between buffings, then it seems to produce clearer results in the end. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just buffing in that compound number two again. And as soon as I'm done with that, then we can move on to compound number three. Now, if you're still watching at this point, you can tell that that epoxy is becoming even more clear. And if you have weak arms and you wanna give up now, you're more than welcome to. But like I said, we wanna achieve extreme clarity with this project. So we're gonna wipe it down with a microfiber towel and we're gonna move on to the third buffing compound. Using the exact same steps as before, we're gonna apply a few drops of bottle number three. The number on the bottle should be 06068. And we're just gonna spread it around with our finger and then we are gonna start buffing it in using that same blue polishing pad. After we're done with that, we're gonna switch over to a red polishing pad and that's considered to be a T20 finish polish. And we're gonna repeat the exact same process. We're gonna use compound number one, we're gonna wipe it off, we're gonna use compound number two, wipe it off, and then use compound number three. And by the time you finish polishing with compound number three, you should notice a significant difference in clarity of your project. Now that we're done with Trey's super secret polishing process, we're gonna use some denatured alcohol and we're just gonna wipe down the entire project. 
And now, as you can see, even before applying any kind of finish, our epoxy is crystal clear. It almost looks like glass over top of these bullets. Hopefully everything I showed you made sense, but if it doesn't and you have a question, just drop it in the comment section down below. We do get a lot of comments and we read pretty much all of them, but we only respond to the ones that ask genuine questions. So if you have a question, drop it in the comment section below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Before we get ready to apply our finish, I want to give you some before shots of the table. As you can see, the epoxy looks crystal clear. And it's always so crazy to me when doing these projects that you can take this epoxy, sand it down to a point where you can't even see the shell casings inside, but then with some hard work and patience, you can bring it right back to this crystal clarity. I really wanted to finish this table with Rubio Monocoat, but I ran out of the activator, so we're going to use Odie's Oil instead. Now, despite any of the social media drama that you might have seen recently about Odie's Oil, they still make a good product. So, all you need to do with this oil is buff it into your project, let it sit for about 30 minutes, and then buff it all off with a cotton towel. I like to use a gray 3M Scotch-Brite pad to buff in the oil, but it is very important that you don't use that pad on your clear epoxy because it will scratch it. 30 minutes after applying the oil, we buff everything off with the cotton towel and then we can go ahead and put our legs back on the bottom of the table. Like I just mentioned, when you're buffing in the oil on the top of the table, it is very important that you do not hit that clear epoxy with that 3M Scotch-Brite pad. These pads are advertised as ultra fine and the last step to a flawless finish, but let me tell you from experience, if you use it on the clear epoxy that you just polished, it will leave scratches that you will be able to see. So the secret to applying the finish to the epoxy is just by using your finger. I guess you could probably use like a microfiber towel and buff it in, but it's just as easy to use your hand and rub the oil all around on the epoxy. The epoxy will not absorb the oil like the wood does, but it definitely still leaves an oil-like finish and increases the clarity of the project. So make sure you apply the oil or whatever finish you're using to not only the wood, but also the epoxy. After the 30 minutes, we buff off all the remaining oil and we are now officially done with this project and ready to take some glamour shots. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video watching me build this project. I have made three or four bullet casing projects like this in that large coffee table mold, but most of them got cut up into charcuterie boards. So this is actually my first coffee table that I've completed in this style. As of right now, this coffee table is still for sale and it comes with that set of four coasters that you saw earlier in the video. I'm sorry I don't have them in the shots right now but it does come with them and I'm asking $1,800 for the whole set. Don't forget, if you're interested, we sell those HDPE epoxy molds on our website in all different sizes. And also links to all the products used in this video will be in the description below the video. And I would love to hear what you guys thought about this table build. So drop any feedback in the comment section down below. If you have an idea that you think I should build next, I would love to hear it down there. As always, if you like this video, make sure you smash that like button. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for all the future videos. Thanks guys for watching. We will see you on the next one.